Shadow of the Air Tree is full of various boss level enemies, and whilst only a handful need to be beaten to progress the main story, the vast majority are optional, and oftentimes just downright hidden in obscure locations. So in this video, I'll be showing you where to find and how to defeat 10 optional bosses you absolutely don't want to skip or give up on, as they yield some utterly fantastic rewards and a ton of interesting lore to flesh out the story of Elden Ring. So without further ado, Let's dive right in. Starting off in, well, the region we start off in, the Gravesite Plain has a natural tendency to draw you north, up towards the Skadu Tree and the various forts in the distance. But one place you'll want a detour, and this is especially relevant for anyone running a high strength, high endurance build, is directly west of the Scorched Ruins Site of Grace, through a dead glade of sorts, before coming to the western nameless mausoleum. Inside, we'll have to face off against the spectral aspects of the Black Jail Knight, wielding a great sword and a full armor set of overlapping steel. Now, he's not too tough of a fight, but given he could very well be the first boss you face in the Shadow Realm, don't feel bad if you have to leave it for a bit and come back later. The entire expansion map, after all, is designed to be tougher, and before collecting a fair few Skedu Tree fragments, barely anything is going to be a walk in the park. Now, there's some bosses coming up later that drop more of those, but as for the Black Jail Knight, the reason you you don't want to skip this one is the awesome looking full heavy armor set that he drops, as well as the Great Sword of Solitude, which scales mostly with a strength build, but benefits a little from dexterity too, with its unique skill of solitary moon slash serving as a good means for staggering smaller opponents, especially useful against the other mausoleum enemies. His armor set too looks incredibly badass, of course you'll need a high stamina build to not be over encumbered by it, but worth equipping at least just to admire the awesome aesthetic. Now, reading the item descriptions here, it appears as though these solitary knights underwent some form of ritual, sacrificing their hearts in order to attain battle prowess. And in order to become a great warrior, presumably in Mesmus Crusade, this knight gave up the person they were. And with this full gear set on the table, I can maybe see the temptation there. Fortunately, we get to enjoy every part of it whilst remaining a resilient tarnished seeking the Elden Throne. The next boss you'll want to defeat can be found at the Fort of Reprimand, a route which additionally can allow you to fully bypass the Castle Ensis boss if you need to. Simply head south from the castle front side of Grace and head along this little valley for a while until you reach a sealed spirit spring. Unlock it by destroying the cairn just above and ride it upwards into the back of the fort, a place crawling with several familiar enemies both inside and out, but the one we're looking for is found in a large room due south of the main Fort of Reprimand site of Grace. Black Knight Edreth is mostly like the other Black Knight enemies, though specifically wields a huge spinning twin blade and immediately comes at us with this winged attack. Luckily, it's fairly easy to dodge this one with the rest of his attacks spinning right past. Plus, you can also use the stairs in this room to confuse the AI a bit. Either way, taking him down will yield us that awesome winged attack that we've just been faced with. The aspect of the Crucible Wings, Ash of War, can be applied to both swords and pole arms, but the best thing to put it on is one of the twin blades to perform this relentless forward spinning attack. But the most useful thing about this move is how it begins by leaping back up and into the air, automatically establishing distance from most enemies and preventing them from interrupting the attack. The skill is said to originate from the life forms of the Crucible, and whilst it isn't the only aspect of the Crucible found in the DLC, it is the only Ash of War, so make sure to try it out. With all the new weapons we can find in Shadow of the Air Tree, you'll no doubt be in need of a bunch more smithing stones. Of course, by this point, you'll likely just have the bell bearings from the base game to buy all of these things, but if not, or if you just want to immediately grab nine free and easy level eight stones, then head to the High Road Cross, Site of Grace, just north of Castle Ensis, and head immediately west, down into this body of water, where we can find the echo of a beheaded troll. Again, very easy fight this one, and a great way to immediately 
immediately bolster your supply of one of the highest level smithing stones. As to the troll's purpose here, well, to hazard a guess, judging by its use of a glint stone sword, I think we can assume that it was another servant of Castellensis. Glintstone magic, of course, is big back in the Raya Lucaria area, from which the elite guard of the castle also originates. So perhaps this troll also originated from that region. After all, we don't see many of these guys otherwise in the lands of shadow. I would also guess that its specific placement just below the sending gate to the ruins of Rao makes it a guardian of said gate, a practice which again is used back in the Lyonia region, where plenty more spectral troll knights are guarding the sending gates at the four belfries. So that's a cool bit of lore that carries over, and the stones are nice too. Now, these next two, or actually three, are must-haves for anybody wanting a nice talisman boost to either HP, FP, or stamina. Death Knights are end bosses for two different catacombs, with the first being found at the end of the Fog Rift. Riding left of the Castle Ensis front entrance, past this guarded overwatch, and eventually through some foggy woods, we'll come to a classic catacomb dungeon, albeit with new Shadow Realm-specific imps. Now, these new variants have more of a lion's mane appearance, and I presume the difference is down to their connection to the Skedu tree rather than the Erd tree. After all, they wouldn't be the only creatures in this land to resemble a lion. At the bottom of these catacombs though, we find something even more curious. At the end of the dungeon, we'll come to a large room where we have to fight the Death Knight, a large humanoid boss with twin axes, lightning capabilities, and a spectral cloak. He's a pretty aggressive guy and can perform an instant death grab, which can be a right pain to dodge, so using summons at least earlier on can draw some aggro to hopefully avoid that. What's most curious though is the giant head that's in the room with him, and which he appears to be guarding. Now this is clearly another aspect of the body of Godwin. Not his actual body that's buried under the deep root depths of the air tree, but not the first additional face we can find either. There's another, which has been there since release, buried under Stormvale Castle. Now I'm not going to spend too long fully explaining the lore of Godwin, but in brief he was the demigod son of America and Godfrey, and the first of the demigods to die, or rather for his soul to die, whilst his body, impaled by the rune of death, lived on soulless, and buried under the deep root depths, it contorted and twisted into this more fish-like shape, and began to spread death roots across the lands between. Many have theorised before that Godwin's additional face under Stormvale is just another aspect of his spreading death roots, but coming back to the Shadow Realm, why then is another head of Godwin buried under the Fogrift catacombs, and why is it being guarded by this Death Knight? Well, reading the item descriptions from defeating him, we can get some idea. First off is the Crimson Amber Medallion, the entire main reason I would say to come down here in the first place, as it's the best HP boosting talisman we can now get in the game, and can provide a much needed boost before you stock up on Skedu Tree fragments. It reads, quote, these medallions of the largest variety were confirmed to Godwin's inner circle of distinguished golden knights." End quote. Now, this seems to imply that the knight fought for Godwin prior to his death, was one of his closest confidants, and thus received this exceptionally powerful boon. The Death Knight's twin axes then add to this story, saying, quote, "...the knight, once the personal guard of Godwin, was also the protector of the Prince of Death's cadaver surrogate." End quote. So this implies that after Godwin's death, the knight remained a loyal protector, becoming himself a Death Knight, now standing guard over Godwin's cadaver surrogates, meaning literally his dead body substitute. Godwin's soul may be gone, but these knights will protect what's left. But where it gets even more interesting is with the second Godwin head found in the Shadow Realm. Very similar deal, it's another catacombs, this time found deep under Rao, which could be accessed by riding around from the Temple Town ruins side of Grace to the entrance. Again, fighting our way to the bottom will face off against another Death Knight, guarding another Godwin head. This one will drop a long haft axe and the level 3 Cerulean Amber Medallion, for those needing that extra FP boost. Overall, it's a very similar fight to the first, and you'll likely have powered up a bit more by this point too. It's worth coming down here, if only for the medallion, but as to the lore, as to why these multiple faces of Godwin can be found in the Lands of Shadow, well, to answer that, we'll also have to come to the Darklight 
catacombs. Which, if you haven't found yet, jump to the Rakshasa timestamp for that exact route. But down here, we can find two things. Firstly, in a chest off of a hidden ledge of the first area, is the plus three Viridian Amber Medallion, no doubt placed here by yet another Death Knight. And indeed, off another hidden ledge in the second area of the dungeon is yet another Death Knight, only this time laying dead over a ledge. From this, we can loot a full armor set, with the helmet first of all reading quotes. The decayed golden wheel that adorns it represents their unbroken loyalty to Godwin, he who became Prince of Death. End quote. Nothing particularly new there, but the rest of the set does read, quote, These knights, once Godwin's personal guard, quested to find their transfigured master's cadaver surrogates for the coming age of the Duskborn. End quote. So this explains just why the Death Knights came here from the land between, setting out to find the dead body of their lord, which it seems two out of three did. Kind of. Though again, Godwin's true body is of course found in the deep root depths. But quite how these aspects arise arrived here is uncertain. Either they came long before somehow, and were later discovered and then guarded by the Death Knights, or perhaps even the Death Knights somehow placed him here themselves, planting Deathroot at the roots of the Skedu tree to regrow Godwin in a land beyond the Erd Tree's influence, then nurturing him and serving as the protector of the Prince of Death's cadaver surrogates. And opening the map at both of the Godwin Head locations, we can also see they're not that far away from each other, so perhaps Perhaps the two remaining Death Knights were even guarding two parts to ends of the same twisted entity. Whatever the case, these bosses certainly don't want to be skipped, as they now hold the best Amber Medallions in the game, and of course further expand on the story of the Prince of Death. Okay, so the path to this next one starts at the Shadow Keep. Through the main gate, you want to head left, then up and around these ramparts through the dining hall before coming to this courtyard of burning ships. Heading to the other end, down both ladders here, there'll then be a hidden passageway behind a painting leading to some sewers and the classic stone coffin descent method, bringing us out at the Recluses River. Now, heading all the way downstream, hopping to the other side here before descending once again by heading back around this bit, and the first boss we don't want to miss around here is found by taking a left where the river forks, bringing us now to the Eastern Nameless Mausoleum. Though this time, the enemy we're fighting isn't entirely nameless. Though the name Rakshasa does literally mean malevolent demon, and I imagine isn't the original name of this terrifying katana-wielding assassin. Now, Rakshasa can be relentlessly aggressive if you give her the chance, and the key to defeating her, I found, was to continually resort to breaking her stance. So much so that she couldn't get a hit in edgeways. Now, there's plenty of Ashes of War that can do that, and if you want to fully cheese it, you can just chuck Giant Hunt onto a spear, and defeating her will yield us a full set, both her great katana and a very, very bloodstained armor. The katana comes with the weed cutter skill, which as the name would suggest is particularly good for slicing down hordes of lower level foes, chaining attacks endlessly provided you have enough FP and stamina, though for the likes of bosses it isn't quite so useful. The armor though is the very definition of glass cannon, increasing both our damage dealt but also our damage taken. And it is literally covered in the blood of her foes, with a description suggesting her lust for carnage is just threatening to break free. Of all the bosses in the Shadow Realm's nameless mausoleums in fact, I would say Rakshasa seems to be the most terrifying, but also badass, with the Black Jail Knight coming in at a close second. Not an armor set you want to miss for definite, and the katana is great too if that's the the type of thing you use in your build. Literally just down from where we fought Rakshasa though, along the alternative fork of the Recluses River, we'll come out at this tranquilish pool being roamed by wild boar and two golden hippopotamuses. Hippopotami? One of those. Now, these guys are nothing compared to the one we have to fight back at the Shadow Keep, and to be fair, it's simple enough to just encircle them atop torrents. But if you are heading through here, on your way to the Darklight Catacombs no doubt, then make sure to take the time to defeat them both, as each will drop an additional Skedu Tree fragment. Crucial items of course for lowering the insane difficulty in the Realm of Shadow, and you'll want to find as many as you possibly 
possibly can as quickly as you can. With that done though, head to the eastern side of the waterfall and descend the gravestones here to reach the Dark Light Depths catacombs, which, as I mentioned several chapters ago, is home to the final, ironically dead, Death Knight. But these aren't the only two golden hippos from which to obtain Skedu Tree fragments. There's also one down in Sharo's hidden grave, just west beyond the Death Rite bird, and another up in the ruins of Rao, found after descending this elevator, just southwest of where we enter the region. All fairly easy enemies that you want to fight to get up that Skedu Tree level quickly. The Bonnie Jail is another dungeon you definitely don't want to miss, and to get there, you'll first want to come to a secret hole, taking us underneath the Morth Ruins and out into the Bonnie Village, then ride south from here and over a bridge to reach the dungeon. We'll get to the boss in a minute, but first up, take note of when you reach this jar elevator, taking us down to a bridge. Before crossing it though, first make sure to ride the elevator back up, as it'll take us to a hidden higher level, where we can pick up the full armor set of knights. One of the the coolest looking sets in the entire game in my opinion, giving off major Sauron vibes and actually probably the best reason to come in here overall. It's the armor worn by the sword hands of knights, and the same in fact to what Jolin wears, an NPC we can interact with as part of the email questline over here. Back in the Bonnie Jail though, head further through this hidden room to find another corpse holding the shield of knights, a semi-corporeal mirror of sorts excellent at blocking against non-physical attacks. There's also potentially a sword to complete this set, but to get that, let's just say you'll have to progress to the end of Jolin's questline, and when prompted, choose to give her an iris of occultation. Bearing in mind, this will lock you out of the alternative spirit summons. With all that acquired though, continue through the Bonnie Jail, and the end boss isn't too much further, continuing this jail's theme of darkness by immediately plunging us into it. Though I wouldn't worry too much because this ascetic Curseblade Labyrinth went down, at least for me, in like six hits, so didn't expect weak foe. And the same could be said for the spirit summons that we get as a reward. Curseblade Mirror, who is speedy but ultimately weak, though as is often the case, there is a sad story behind these ashes. You see, Curseblade Mirror, the ashes, and Curseblade Labyrinth, the boss, were both imprisoned long ago in the Bonnie Jail, shunned for their omen horns and thrown into these dark depths. But in finding one another, a light yet shone. For the two, being in the dark, still had one another as company. But when Mira perished, Labyrinth was plunged into a devastating darkness. A darkness which it seems is eventually extended to us and the arena in which we fight. Indeed, this darkness we have to contend with in this very briefest of battles seems to be, tragically, the personification of Labyrinth's grief. And now now I just feel straight up bad for killing the poor thing, but equally maybe we've put them out of their misery. And perhaps there's more to be read into the story here, though I feel like that's often the point with these. That we the player, if inclined to read item descriptions, are supposed to infer additional parts of the story for ourselves. These next two are a very common and familiar boss, which we all know, but these alterated tree spirits are well worth tracking down to obtain their unique talismans. The first one is hidden down in the Poison Lake of Bellarat. Before accessing the area though, we'll first have to find the Wellroot Depths Key. So where you want to head is up from the Bellarat Site of Grace, around onto the rooftops with the grave birds, before dropping down off the end where this purple fabric is into this obscure little room. The key is immediately behind you to your left, and with it you then want to head directly south via the route on screen and climb down a well, where we can now open this door to descend into the poison lake below. From here, you'll again want to head directly south to find the ulcerated tree spirit. I think we all know the deal with these by now. They're large enemies, but all their attacks are fairly telegraphed and avoidable. So, defeating it then, it'll drop the plus two immunizing horn charm, a horn scent artifact that vastly raises our resistance to to both poison and rot. Hey, that's pretty useful, considering exactly where we're standing right now, and is a good thing to equip in specific areas for the rest of your playthrough. Caled, the Halic Tree, and the Lake of Rot, to name but a few more. The second tree spirit then, 
can be found a ways to the east, down in the Alak River Valley, accessible either by jumping down the gravestones south of the Temple Town ruins, heading through the Alak River Cave near Castle Ensis, which I covered in the Black Knight Edreth chapter, or we could instead pull off some major parkour heading upstream from the Cerulean coast. Either way, just under the Great Bridge to Castle Ensis, there'll be another ulcerated tree spirit, and this one will drop the Hornban, a reusable item scaling with faith and intelligence, which we can use to summon orbs, or vengeful spirits, to act as a sort of seeker missile attack against enemies. Now, canonically, these are made to memorialize the many horned omens who died too young. And I suppose, in a dark way, the summoned vengeful spirits could in fact be those of deceased omen, or rather horn scent, children. Also with this, if you're one to use a mimic tier at all, then having it equipped will enable the mimic to also use the spell in combat. Now, if you simply adored the Divine Beast Dancing Lion boss at Bellarat, then I have some good news for you. There is another. And this one is arguably actually tougher. Starting from the Rao Ancient Ruins West side of Grace, head up these stairs, take the elevator on your left, and as you come out here, double back around this corner, to the left, and drop down onto these ramparts. Now, this is a secret route, which will bring us out at the Ancient Ruins Grand Staircase, and heading further along, we can finally kill that archer giant for starters, but don't stop there. Head further to the northeast and drop off this ledge to another temple ruin, home to yet another dancing lion. A very similar fight to the first, but with two major differences. Firstly, we can ride torrent for this one, not something I'd particularly recommend for the entire fight, but useful for one specific part. You see, unlike the Bellarat lion, this one also has the ability to summon basilisks and encircle it itself in this death blight mist. Of course, I recommend rejuvenating boluses for the fight, but also riding through and defeating the basilisks on torrents can help reduce our exposure to the death blight. And as to why this lion has this additional ability, well, to speculate for a second, notice this temple is specifically located between the Fog Rift and Scorpion River catacombs. In fact, it's more or less directly above where both aspects of Godwin's corpse are finally found, where we fight the death knights. So, I would guess that in the time the lion has been here, it's possibly become exposed to whatever part of Godwin exists in the depths below, and has taken on an aspect of the Prince of Death for itself. Though that of course is just my speculation, and aside from the ability, there don't appear to be any signs of death roots in the immediate area. Defeating the lion though will this time grant us a new incantation. The Divine Beast Tornado is the same spinning ability the beast used against us, and I find to be particularly useful for inflicting AoE damage. From its description, we can also learn that most of the divine beasts in the Land of Shadow were gored and hung upon spears, then burned in Mesmer's Crusade. And I'd imagine that refers not just to the lions, but to any of the creatures born of the Crucible's vitality, such as the Golden Hippos too. Though that doesn't explain why there's one guarding the Shadow Keep, mind you, so I'll have to do some more digging on that lore for a future video. Last on the list for today is actually one of the legendary bosses, though one that is relentlessly aggressive and particularly difficult to dodge. Commander Gaius is completely optional, and being comfortably tucked away at the northern end of the Shadow Realm, it could be very tempting to just leave him to riding his ball. But you really don't want to just do that, and we'll get to why. But first up is how to reach him. You'll first want to come around to the back of the Shadow Keep, basically take this northern road from the bottom village all the way up and around to the flooded church district, then hop across the ramparts on this route until reaching an elevator, taking us to the back room of the storehouse. From here, you want to make your way upwards via the various stairs and ladders before coming to the storehouse loft side of Grace, and then taking an elevator onto the uppermost rafters. Travelling across these to the other side, we'll be able to drop down to another room leading to an elevator, which will descend back down to the Skeduview region of the map. Then the arena 
arena to fight Commander Gaius is directly ahead. But be warned, this guy charges in fast and with a relentless string of attacks, including a boar charge wherein we can be hit by both sets of legs and require near enough frame-perfect timing to dodge both of them. If you do want to use summons or something, then good luck, because he'll charge you before you can actually do that. However, if you don't mind cheesing the guy a little, you can immediately head around this corner at the start of the fight to bring in your summon and any other prep. Because when it's near inevitable that you'll miss several of these dodges even with plenty of practice, offsetting some of that aggro will definitely make life a whole lot easier. You can also ride Torrent for this fight, but given Gaius is actually faster aboard his boar, I definitely wouldn't recommend that. Believe me, I tried it plenty of times in plenty of different ways. Now, Gaius also utilizes a bunch of gravitational magic, very similar to Radan, and when we read the description of his Remembrance armor set after defeating him, we in fact learn that he was the senior disciple of the same Alabaster Lord who taught Radan his techniques. Now, we don't know which Alabaster Lord that is, and there's a good few that we'll face through the game, but what matters is that Gaius is effectively fighting mounted, albeit with the same techniques as Radan. And to be fair, the boss fights are very similar. Though the champion set of Gaius isn't the only reason to power through and beat this guy. And with my build that mostly involves dodging, it was definitely more like struggle through for a good long while there. See, beyond his arena, we can head further north to this huge structure with something called the Skedu Tree Chalice at the base of it. And here we can pick up no less than five Skedu Tree fragments for a very nice additional damage depth and reduced damage taken. And I think many of the complaints as to this DLC's difficulty may have come from people who haven't collected enough of these. Because whilst the game by no means becomes easy after scaling our Skedu Tree level, it certainly becomes a lot easier. And Gaius just happened to be guarding one of the best Skedu Tree sources in the game. But that's not all. Beyond the wall is also a little Albanoric shack, housing one wolf-mounted Albanoric and the sharp shot talisman for boosting the attack power of precision aimed shots. The Albanoric also will drop Gaius's greaves, which you'll notice are omitted from the rest of his remembrance gear. In fact, they're described as being made as, quote, a cruel joke for he could not wear them. Riding atop the boar he called his other half, Gaius was in fact a warrior of Albanoric extraction." End quote. Now Albanorics, of course, are destined to lose the use of their legs, and we can see this in places like the Albanoric village of Lyania, as well as of course the many wolf-mounted Albanoric archers throughout the game. Clearly, the same fate is true of Gaius, thus pretty much making the boar serve as his only form of legs. But whilst Gaius would never be able to wear these greaves, leaving them back at the shack with his Albanoric companion, it doesn't mean we can't enjoy them along with the rest of the set. So a number of brilliant rewards for defeating, what, the guardian of the Skedu Tree Chalice? I mean, that presumably is his purpose up here. Though do comment below your own theories as to what exactly Commander Gaius' role could be in the Shadow of the Erd Tree story. We do know of course that he is connected to Radan, but whether posted here by Marika or Mikola perhaps, is something that's going to require further looking into for another video. Thank you very much for watching this one. I hope you learned something useful, whether it was a hidden location you haven't found yet, or just some lore that you hadn't picked up on. Huge thank you to the patrons, as always, for going the extra mile to keep the channel alive. I'm Sam Bram, and have a great day.